Hey, Redcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible. With special thanks to Revenant, the Nerd in Warpaint, Antonio Hernandez, Ice Storm Shadow, Michael Kahn's, Nathan Welch Jr., and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. And welcome back to the Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous Beta. As we pick up where we left off last time and continue exploring the thriving markets of Canabras. Obviously, the uh, market has seen slightly better days. There appear to be a number of new road features, which are making navigation somewhat difficult. But we do seem to have found a nice crossing point for one of the um, features. So let's do that and uh, see what else the marketplace has to offer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guess that's serviceable. Okay, so we've got an open path on the left and some rubble we can move on the right. Let's have a look at our skills real quick. I think we'll avoid the rubble for now. That's a 50-50 shot, and I am not comfortable with that. We do need to tread a bit lightly um, due to the unavoidable mishap with that summoning circle. Uh, apparently we're also under attack. I guess we'll take their word on that. Uh, let's push up, see if we can get eyes on. Hmm. All right, well, I guess we will um, push up a bit more aggressively. Ah, I see. Oh, hello there. Nice hit. Fiendish or not, these are still just vermin. I think we'll just have her chill out. Pretty sure we've got this. Hi there. <laughs> Tonk. Oh, and uh, this is a good chance to slot Coup de Gras, which I totally forgot existed. Yeah. 
Yep, that seems about right. Coup de Gras is, of course, a rule from the tabletop version, but um, while they did have it in Kingmaker, I don't think they actually added it in until the Year One edition, though I would have to double-check that. And uh, it is not on your hotbar by default, so I just don't really think about it. Obviously, we'll uh, get some better use out of it now that we've got Ember tagging along. An ambush. Send these vermin a message. The rightful owner has returned, and their kind is no longer welcome. Sorry, that's the uh, first thing that springs to mind when I think about vermin. Nice shot. Yeah, Lion's Call was probably overkill. But you never know what's um, lurking just out of sight. Make every strike count. Wow. Nicely done, Lan. Guys, nice work. Don't believe in yourselves. Believe in me who believes in you. Oh. Stories told us by spirits. The Night with Harrowed Hands. Canabras Medium Alliance Publishing. The demon puts two plates on the table in front of me. On each, a bleeding human heart. Look, he says, the right one belongs to a noble and righteous man, a loyal servant of Iomade. The left one is the heart of a murderer and a scoundrel, but something tells me that they taste exactly the same. I remain silent and don't move. I couldn't if I tried. One of my hands is pinned to the wide armrest with a knife thrust to the hilt, the other similarly pinned helpless on the table. The demon circles and carefully brushes away a strand of hair that stuck to my forehead. Your silence saddens me. Don't waste your time on this performance, monster, I say, though I have scarcely the energy to breathe. If you wish to torture me, go ahead. If you want to kill me, then kill me. My life is in your hands. But my soul is not, and never will be. The hearts on the plates in front of me continue oozing blood. They've only just been ripped from their owner's bodies. The right one, apparently, belonged to my partner, the left to the criminal we were escorting. But the demon, who'd set his lair in the old mill, killed without discrimination. He walks around the armchair and stops behind my back, placing a clawed hand on my shoulder. This is not a performance at all. It's a feast, and I will be sated. No, not with this. You can see my eyes still on the hearts. With you, it's your heart that's in front of me right now. So, helpless. The claws on my shoulder tighten a bit. Goddess, help me endure. After a moment, the demon continues. You know what you don't understand, you zealous servants of law and good. He seems to like the sound of his own voice. 
It was you who brought us to your land. The more of you who gather here at the edge of the world wound, so brave, burning with righteous wrath, the more like me will come from the abyss. It's not because we want to win a war and conquer your world. Perhaps our lords want this, but trust me, they are as far removed from their subjects as your lords and kings are from you. No, we come for those like you, for the persistent and the proud, who won't break until the very end, for those whose suffering is sweet and lasts and lasts, for the sweets. He appears in front of me again, licking his lips. I well know that he'll never grant me a quick death. Oh, well, that's just, um, lovely. Not quite the type of book you'd expect to find in a place like Canabras. Though, uh, I suppose it does make you wonder if the Canabras Medium Alliance Publishing Company is uh, actually in league with the demons, and this is just like part of a long-term demoralization campaign. Mobility check. Let's have a look at our numbers. Huh. Well, that's weird. Wolgif is not trained in mobility. He put those points into athletics instead, uh, which is an interesting choice. Not one I would have made, but sure, why not? We do have Lan, but even with him, we're still looking at a coin toss, which, considering that we're currently running on fumes, I am not comfortable with. Oh, good. Inquisitor Halrun. My beloved brother, I admire your zeal, of course, but would you not agree this is hardly the time to be standing guard over a hole that no one will ever emerge from? Or perhaps you're concerned that someone will decide to go for a nighttime stroll and will accidentally fall into it. Such foresight is laudable, but do you really need so many soldiers for such a task? Can't your warriors be put to better use, for instance, fighting demons, or clearing rubble while the people trapped beneath it might still be alive? The face of this golden-curled Azamar is beautiful, even by the standards of his kind, in whose vein runs the blood of angels. His melodious voice sounds cheerful, but bitter reproach simmers in his gaze. Don't you dare call me brother, heretic. The signs of recent hard fighting are obvious in this stern old man. His armor is dented and covered in blood, and his unnatural pallor suggests something more dangerous than wounds inflicted by claws and fangs. Nevertheless, his gaze is stony, and his voice, accustomed to barking orders, is harsh and clipped. How dare you accuse me of doing nothing to protect this city! especially now when followers of your temple were caught committing treason. To my mind, you are no different than the demon worshippers, those miscreants, those beasts that are digging under the city walls. Everyone knows, my dearest prelate, that in your zealous pursuit of order in the city, you have long since forgotten how to tell friend from foe and good from evil. That's what happened with my adepts, whose act of treason was a genuine attempt to save the city. And yet again, I am forced to repeat myself. While we are wasting time on pointless quarrels, people are dying under the rubble in our city. People whom we could have saved if you had only set your soldiers to task and not kept them here, surrounding a useless and utterly harmless hole in the ground. Harmless? Well, if it's on your say-so, then that must mean there is something down there. Your associates, no doubt. And they're just waiting for us to abandon our post before they slink out and try again to... The old man notices your approach. And you, I remember you. You appeared in my city the day the demons attacked, and Terendalev died. What are you doing here? Answer at once, or I'll have you strung up by your ankles before you know it. Don't think that the demons have wounded me. 
I still have enough strength to take on a hundred of your sort. And what is this hideous creature? Halrin peers at Lan with suspicion. Lan, at your service. The mongrel ducks his head in a bow. My forebears fought in the First Crusade. I've lived in Canabras my whole life. You haven't ever seen me before. Uh, it must be because you don't ever venture into our underground district. We have been meaning to complain to the city authorities that our paving stones have been in need of repair for a long time. The First Crusade. So you're a mongrel? <laughs> you obviously know human speech. Surprisingly well, in fact. All right, let's be off with you. The prelate looks at you. If he causes any trouble, I shall hold you responsible. Come to think of it, you still haven't told me who you are. I am a crusader. I'm fighting to liberate Canabras from the demons. A crusader, you say? Huh. I'll be looking into that. You obviously don't know to whom you are speaking. I am the one who decides who's a crusader and who's a traitor in this city. Halrun Shapuk, prelate of Canabras by the grace of Her Majesty Queen Galfrey, and the city's defender against threats from within and without. And, as we can see, you've done a sterling job protecting the city. The golden-haired Azamar flashes a flinty smile. I am Ramian of Edme, prior of the Temple of Desna, which, alas, currently lies in ruins. Wise Holren here believes it is vital to guard this hole in the ground, from which he is certain demons will emerge at any moment. I have been trying to convince him that the city has far more urgent matters to deal with. For instance, rescuing those currently dying under the rubble. You know what? There may in fact be one matter that is more important than guarding this hole. I put it off and put it off, and look where it's led us. I should have had you hung from the gates back when you dared to defend your gang of delinquent demon collaborators. If the Sarkorians had hanged Arilu Vorlesh while they had the chance, there never would have been a war. I won't repeat their mistake. I won't hesitate any longer. Soldiers, seize this scum. Prelate, see reason. These are frightening times. But threatening to hang someone without trial? That is unworthy of a servant of Ioma Day. The old man fixes his eyes on Sila. Lest you forget, girl, we may serve the same goddess, but you are not an inquisitor. Don't question the way I choose to serve Iomade, and I won't question yours. What precisely are you accusing Ramian of, inquisitor? Treason. Not long before the city was attacked, several followers from his temple tried to secretly access the Wardstone and perform an unknown ritual over it. Halren is trembling with fury. The Wardstone of Canabras. The gift from Iomade, the bringer of light, wrought by the hands of her herald, the first in the chain. And followers of that crazy runt of a goddess try to meddle with it using their magic after hearing a voice in their dreams. My soldiers almost had them caught when Ramian got in the way, allowing the traitors to go to ground. I made a mistake. I didn't have him locked in a cell and interrogated to within an inch of his life. And now the city lies in ruins. It's time to rectify that mistake. I've told you before, and I'll tell you again. My people foresaw the attack on the city. They knew the Wardstone already carried the seed of corruption within itself and they were simply trying to heal it. I've heard similar claims before. Now, where was it? Ah, yes, from Staunton Vane, the traitor who brought down Drezen. The lessons of the past have taught us a great deal, and that is why I never believed you or your mob's lies, even for a second. And I was right. Behold, Inquisitor, 
I bear the gift of an angel who died in the caves below Canabras. I am no enemy of yours. The old man frowns and whispers something. A prayer or a spell? With each word, his face relaxes. You are telling the truth. The light in your hand was wrought by the power of heaven. I will keep an open mind with regard to you, stranger. And later, under less fractious circumstances, I would like to ask you about how you came to receive this gift. But that can wait. Now I must deal with this filth once and for all. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. So obviously we should it we should intervene, but both of these responses seem a bit more extreme than I would like. But I suppose if we're going to be forced to pick sides, we should probably side with Ramiel and uh, Desna. We are pursuing the path of the uh, Azada, after all, and that's pretty much Desna to a T. Also, um, you might not have noticed, but Halrin is kind of a jackass, so... Don't lay a finger on him, or you'll have to answer to me. The Azamar holds up his hands in a placating gesture. Stop. You are the defenders of what remains of Canabras. Can't you think of anything better to do than be at each other's throats in the ruins of the city? Ramian looks at the prelate. You're a fool, Halrin. You're a zealot and a murderer. But you're a fool first and foremost. I told you that the Wardstone was weakened. You wouldn't listen. I warned you that the city was going to be attacked. You shooed me away. The truth is that my young adepts were trying to save the Wardstone, and you stopped them. Of course, those truly responsible for this tragedy are the demons. But you have done nothing to prevent it. And now you would still rather kill an innocent person and perish yourself than admit that you were wrong. As always. With a wave of his wand, the Azamar vanishes. He fled, the heretic. He's no doubt expecting me to rush off in pursuit. But that won't work on me. Ulrin turns his attention to you. What about you? If you truly have been marked out for a gift from heaven, this is your chance to save the city. Go and bring back that filthy traitor. I am almost certain that he and his cronies were helping the demons, either knowingly or unknowingly. Their attempt to bewitch the Wardstone is clear proof. Ramian must be captured. I see you suffered greatly in battle. Nonsense. I had to deal with a brood of shadow demons. It was nothing. I've taken on worse enemies with the goddess's help. Shadow demons have the ability to drain their victim's life force. Judging by Halrin's pallor, he has lost a significant amount of his energy. The Inquisitor can bluster as much as he wants, but right now, he's far from the peak of his abilities. Why are you so obsessed with finding enemies everywhere you look? Why? Why? You must not be from these parts, or you wouldn't have asked such a question. I look for enemies everywhere because our enemies are everywhere. Who are we at war with? Demons. Demons and cultists. They are masters of deception. They worm their way into your favor and masquerade in all manner of false guises. Do you think Dresden was taken by force? No, by trickery. Were it not for me, Canabras would have gone the same way long ago, captured out from under our noses. Now listen to what I am about to tell you. This was a long time ago. I was very young then, and I had just joined the Crusade. Back then, Canabras didn't have a garrison so much as a public thoroughfare. Anyone who wanted could just stroll into the city. One day, at dawn, a group of refugees came up to the city gates, bold as brass. 
The guards let them in, and why not, for no one was ever turned away. Twas no matter. Everyone was welcome in our city. If you came from Mendev, or if you'd hauled yourself here from across the seas, the crusade accepted all and sundry. But on this occasion, we paid dearly for our laxity. Just as soon as those innocent lambs entered the city, they transformed into demons and rushed towards the Wardstone, slaughtering everyone who tried to stop them. Sixty-two people died in less than a minute. The demons used their mutilated corpses to desecrate the obelisk. None of them dared to go near it. The light of the goddess burned them all. So they threw the blood from afar, spattering the Wardstone from every direction. And the lead demon, an eyeless beast, Monago is her name, jeered and gloated, saying we mortals had been sitting ducks. And the creature was right, too. We let our guard down and we got what we deserved. The bloodbath came to be known as the Red Morning Massacre, and it was burned into the townsfolk's memories. Since then, Canabras has adopted different practices. Heretics, cultists, spies, all the rabble who coveted Aurelu's glory. We drove them all out of the city. We haven't had any trouble here since. Many have come here, even the Baylor Karamzada, and they have all been sent straight back to where they came from, or else they were killed for their trouble. You see, Discari himself had to crawl out of the abyss and come here, the goddess curse him, in order to break through our defenses. And what did he do? He left again. And we're still fighting. Now that is what vigilance and discipline can do. I mean, that's not the takeaway I would have had, but, um, sure. Ramian really warned you about the attack? Those crazed Desnans were always bursting into my office with their incoherent prophecies that came to them in their dreams. I won't lie, sometimes what they said did come to pass, but can we really rely on the woolly dreams of heretics over the cold hard facts of intelligence reports? Plenty of demons could have easily fooled them and, and whispered a treasonous plan in their dreams, and those lunatics would have been only too happy to listen. I mean, yeah, I can, uh... I can kind of see where he's coming from. This time, Mr. Curls for Brains came to me and declared that demons were about to attack the city and that the Wardstone's power was diminished by some kind of contamination or taint. Iomade forgive me for even repeating the words. After uttering such blasphemy, he should have been locked up along with his followers and interrogated. But instead, I simply increased the surveillance on them. And what next? My people caught them red-handed, trying to attack the Wardstone with unknown magic. And not three days later, the demons attacked the city. There's an obvious connection between these events. Whether deliberately or under demonic influence, the Desnans played right into the hands of Discari's hordes. And they almost left the city completely defenseless. Ramian covered for his people the whole time and helped them escape my guards. After that, what else can he be but a traitor and a heretic? Hmm. I don't know, man. Based on what we're hearing, Ramian was trying to tell him the same exact thing the storyteller was, and he just refused to believe either of them. There's nothing dangerous in this hole. You have no reason to guard it. You told me yourself that you received a light-bringing gift from an angel who perished in the caves below our feet. It is no secret that those passages are teeming with dangerous creatures that could kill anyone, even a warrior of heaven. Demons and demonic offspring love roaming about underground. That's why I will be keeping an eye on this hole. If the beasts decide to attack from here, we'll be ready for them. Right, you have fun with that. Where can I find Ramian? How should I know? The weasel can't have gone far. He turned invisible. He's probably hunkered down in some hole like the traitorous little rat he is. And he'll be sitting, trembling, and waiting till he's dragged out of there. 
put the prelate after you. That uh, seems like the only sensible thing to do. It's what I'd do. I'm sure a lot of things sound sensible to you. And it works, too. As you can see, I'm still alive. <laughs> all right, Halrun. I have to go. Go on, then, if you have to. It would be good if you could return with the head of that scum. Ember peers intently at Hullrun. I remember you. When Father and I arrived in this city, you met us. Uh-oh. What is this gibberish? As if I have nothing better to do than arrange meetings with vagrants. But it's true. You and the other knights tied us to stakes and started lighting the bonfire. Father died, and then one of your knights changed his mind and pulled me from the flames. But then he died, too. Don't you remember? If you were burned, then it was with good reason. You say some traitor helped you escape from the fire? That is a crime in itself, which means that you have been evading justice all these years. If it weren't for the invasion, I would review your case and see that your sentence was finally fulfilled. You're lucky that we have more important matters to deal with right now. He didn't look the way he does now, all wrinkled and gray. He was young, with a big mustache. Ember smiles broadly and draws a large, bushy mustache in the air with her finger. He probably forgot all about me. It was a long time ago. But I do want to say one thing. I'm not cross with him. This knight is a true hero. He just really, really wanted to protect his city. Only he got all mixed up about who was good and who was evil. Hmm. Not much point in trying to shame, Halrun. In fact, that might just make things worse. You forgive him? After what he did to you? He thought he was doing what was right. How do you know? Maybe you've done something thinking it was a good thing, but you were really doing a bad thing that hurt someone? But what if... What if I've done the same thing? You can't get angry at people for making mistakes when you might be no better than them. Fascinating. Ember is a very intriguing character. I'm really honestly not sure what to make of her. Uh, but like I said, not much point in trying to confront Halren, so... Come on, Ember. Let's go. Yes, let's go. Bye-bye, kind knight. The girl waves to Halren with a carefree smile. Halrin grimaces and turns away. Interesting. Very interesting. Someone appears to have uh, misplaced the color out of space. Day 15. Month. Gozren. Year 4710. The demon invasion transformed all of Canabras into one great battlefield. But nowhere in the city suffered as much as this square. This place saw a clash of titans. The demon Lord Daskari leading his hordes from the abyss and the dragon Terendalev, the mightiest of the city's defenders, and one of the first to fall. The scene of destruction leaves no doubt as to the battle's outcome. A skilled pathfinder could recreate the course of the battle, moment by moment, simply by looking at the ruins. From the chimneys torn down by powerful wings and a sharp dive, to the bloody tracks left behind when the demon dragged away the noble reptile's broken body but it is no hypothetical pathfinder gazing upon the ruins. It is Creed Ironfang, and he is not alone. The shadow of a strange, barely perceptible presence lingers over this place. Like a gaze untethered from any observer, this mysterious force, unknown to mortal kind, 
silently assesses, judges, and seeks a better way. In an instant, Creed Iron Fang is vested with this power and looks at the world with its eyes. The past, present, and future stand before him as a unified whole, an unmoving, multifaceted crystal that would be beautiful were it not for the fractures, blemishes, and flecks marring its splendor. What past does he see? In the past exists the one who wielded this gaze in life, although the one and life are in opposite terms for aeons, the supernatural embodiments of cosmic balance. Rather than who or what, a better word for these entities is how. This aeon appeared from outside this world, from the great beyond, to put an end to the intermingling of the planes and destroy the world wound, the chasm disrupting the order of the multiverse. Alas, the visitor from beyond proved too weak for the battle they came to fight. They even failed to finish casting the spell that would have sent Discari back to the abyss. With one swing of his scythe, the Demon Lord cut the Aeon down. What present does he see? Ruins, blood, corpses. None of this perturbs the Aeon's dispassionate gaze. The living are alive. The dead will be judged by Phirasma. All is as it should be. But the demons circling in the sky or prowling through the street create a jarring juxtaposition like splashes of blood-red ink on a restrained pencil sketch. They should not be here. The world of mortals is for mortals. The demon's place is in the demon world. How sublime the world would be if everything in it knew its place. But even the demons aren't as abhorrent as the sharp-edged, unassuming crystal, languishing in the dirt among the bricks and smashed cobblestones. No mortal would notice it, but to the Aeon's eyes, its mere existence is an outrage against universal laws. If the Aeon still existed, they would not stop until the crystal was unmade. But the Aeon is gone, and only their gaze remains. Creed Iron Fang picks the crystal up out of the dirt and stows it in his pocket. He is mortal, which means he has the power to decide what to do with it. What future does he see? Good and evil, chaos and order, everything is in its lawful place in the multiverse and is no longer trespassing where it does not belong. Nothing is disrupting the smooth and steady current of the river of souls from life into death and back to life again. The crystal of reality, rid of its flaws, is now perfect and the Aeons withdraw to eternally admire its beauty, which will never be threatened again. After allowing the hero to view the world through their eyes, the little that remained of the destroyed Aeon, is killed even appropriate here for an entity that is so removed from life and death as we understand them, used up its last vestiges of energy. Now they are ready to disperse into nothingness, unless someone decides to preserve the Aeon within themselves. Will the hero take on this power, so that he may again look at the world through another's eyes? Or will he allow it to vanish? We'll just hold on to that. The spirit of the Aeon dwells out of sight, deep in Creed Iron Fang's soul. Like a pair of magical spectacles stowed away, until the moment when the hero once again needs to look at the world through another's eyes. Wow, that, uh... It almost makes me sad that we're not doing the Aeon's Path. Though I do like to keep my options open, so... Uh, we'll just hold on to this for now. Though obviously it would be uh, 
significantly more useful if we were in fact a an offensive caster. All right, so we uh, appear to have once again come full circle. We are back in the fairgrounds where all this started. Let's secure the area, and uh, I think we'll be at a good stopping point. Ah, one more fight to uh, wrap things up with. That's good. It's a nice uh, palate cleanser between all these giant narrative events. Always be ready for the worst. I'm here. Where else would I be? <laughs> I win! Goodness. Critical sneak attack. And yet, still somehow disappointing, because it did not immediately explode over a 10-foot radius. No point in rushing in. We'll form a line, see what else they throw at us. Caster. Oh, Cleric. Moving up. Two clerics and a cultist. That is an unusual mix. Nice. Waljith, still killing it with that crossbow. Lan, slightly less impressive. Um, good effort. That was quite a wind-up for four damage. Right, gotta be within five feet. Got it. Oh, wall Jeff with a rare whiff. Uh, land, here's your shot. Nicely done. I mean, you kind of bopped that first shot, but nice follow through. As for this guy. That's fine. He didn't really need that spine anyway. Ooh, magic half plate. Eh, plus one. Now, sadly, as much as I would like to slap that on Creed, because I think that would actually boost his AC to 26, um, we cannot do that without reducing his movement to 15, which, as we saw in those early episodes, was just too slow for a frontline fighter. 
It's weird because the armor itself doesn't actually slow him down. It's the medium encumbrance that's doing it. Obviously, that won't be an issue once uh, he can just ride Kaiser around, or once we start boosting his strength. But until then, I am afraid that armor will be going to Sela. Sorry, Creed. It's hard to believe that this place recently held a bustling and festive market. My tail is twitching. Must be a sign. Judging by the size of the bloodstain, the body of something truly enormous was dragged over these stones. Terendalev, most likely. I imagine the intent is that we're supposed to follow that blood trail. Oh, nice. A 500 gold piece emerald. It's rare to find vendor trash that uh, actually feels like treasure. Anyway, um, we've secured the fairgrounds, or what's left of them, which is where this whole mess started. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a good breakpoint. Let's see, what did we get done today? We secured our crossing point to the inner city. We met Holren and Ramian. We found that interesting book. We eliminated some assorted vermin and these cultists right here. And we found a shard of an Aeon. Not too shabby. Plus that magic half plate, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at. That said, we will uh, hit the pause button for now, but we will pick up here next time. As we probably end up following that rather distinct blood trail. But we do need to find our way back out to the world map at some point so we can uh, push on to the Blackwing Library, discover the fate of the mysterious storyteller. See you then. Oh, and remember, although I do love playing Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official YouTube and Twitch channels, the official social media feeds, or the official store pages. As always, links are in the description.